ministry of compassion. Reaching the unreached and telling the untold. Proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ and his love for you. Ladies and gentlemen, from Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas, Dodie Osteen. Praise the Lord. Well, we welcome you to the Oasis of Love in a Troubled World right here in Houston, Texas. We're in a service now. We've been having a good time ministering to the Lord, and, and God's blessed, and we've been praying for sick people, and we believe that they got healed today. And I want to encourage those of you in the Houston area uh, to come by and see us at the Oasis of Love. We're not all that far away and it's worth the drive. And those of you who are in other cities, way away even, if you're ever in Houston visiting, we want you to come by and see us. Now we're going to go on with the service and with the teaching of the Word. And uh, my husband, John Osteen, is going to minister the Word of God, and it'll be good. So we want you to get it down in your hearts, because faith cometh by hearing. The Lord bless you. Here he is, John Osteen. Amen. Thank you, baby. Let's all clap for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. I'd like to welcome also the audience, myself. Thank you, Dodie, for that introduction. And uh, we want to encourage you to get your Bibles and go right along with us. We're teaching in the series. This is uh, lesson number six on understanding our redemption. We're talking from the book of uh, Ephesians, and if you'd like to get your Bible, you can do so, and we'll study along with you. Let's lift our Bibles and make the devil mad. Raise your Bible up and wiggle it around. Everybody say, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. Doesn't that make you feel good? All right, Ephesians chapter 4 and chapter 5. We have been talking about understanding our redemption. Paul was in jail when he wrote these, uh, these letters, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. And he was giving a revelation from God for the church of all ages. In chapter 4, verse 1, it says, I beg of you, and I'm reading, by the way, from the Living Bible, which is not a translation, which is simply a paraphrased Bible, but it makes it very clear to us. I'll be quoting from the King James too. I beg of you, a prisoner here in jail for serving the Lord, to live and act in a way worthy of those who have been chosen for such wonderful blessings as these. Now let me, let me just pause and just talk about that a moment. He said, I am here in jail. I have been revealing to you these mighty redemptive truths. I have been unveiling to you God's love. Now that you have seen and understood, I want you to live right. I want you to live like people ought to live who have received such blessings. Now, let me remind you here just a few minutes what we have talked about in these past five lessons. First of all, we talked about what Christ had done for us. The Bible says, now that Jesus has died and risen again, we are declared by God as not guilty. Everybody shout, not guilty. <laughs> you know, when the jury comes in and the foreman hands the judge the little white piece of paper, and the judge takes it, and he reads the verdict. It's either bad news or good news. Well, I want to tell you, the book of Ephesians tells us that the great trial has, been, has, has already been over. The jury has been out, and the judge now has the verdict about you and the whole world, and he declares you because of what Christ has done, not guilty. Amen. Glory to God. The other word is acquittal. That means that you are not guilty, acquitted of the crimes. 
Another thing he's done, he has taken the list of sins you have committed and nailed it to his cross and died for it. Another phrase, it says he, that he took away all of our sins and thereby took away Satan's power to accuse us. He is walking about accusing, condemning everybody he can. But when he looks at us, we can say, Satan, look written across me, not guilty. Acquitted, clean, forgiven. That's some, something he's talking about in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, these mighty blessings. Well, we think about what Christ did, uh, all the blessings we have there in chapter 1. Uh, because we're in Christ, we're blessed with all the blessings of heaven. We have been chosen in, in him before the foundation of the world. We have been made holy and without fault before him. Not anything left against us that God could even chide us for. And then he has sealed us with the Holy Ghost, guaranteeing that he'll bring us to heaven. We talked about the fact of who Jesus is. You know, the book of Ephesians, Philippians and Colossians and all the New Testament really reveals and unveils who Jesus really is. He is not a little effeminate man that walked around on this earth. He is not a babe in Bethlehem. I want you to know before the world began, Jesus was there. The book of Colossians says he was before all things and created all things. He is the exact image of the invisible God. And the book of Hebrews says, and when he had, uh, that God has spoken in times past by the prophets in various ways, but he has in these last days spoken in his son by whom he created the worlds. And that Jesus is the exact image of the invisible God and he uh, creates and propels and keeps the whole universe in his orbit by his mighty word of power. And when he had purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Well, go ahead and give him a hand. We saw who Jesus really is. We saw him in the book of Revelation, chapter 1. When John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard me a, behind me a mighty voice, the voice of many waters, and I turned to look and see, and he saw Jesus. But he wasn't a little effeminate weakling, no. He turned and saw Jesus. His face was like the sun, his eyes like flame of fire. He was pulsating with the eternal life of God. And he said to John, fear not, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. I am, I am the one that was dead. In other words, he's saying, I'm that Jesus that was born of Mary. I was that Jesus that was brought up uh, out of Egypt. I was that Jesus that came to Nazareth. I was that Jesus uh, that entered into my ministry at the baptism of John. I was that Jesus that cast out devils. I was the same Jesus that, uh, that slept in that boat. I was the one that st stilled that storm. I was the one that opened the eyes of the blind. I was the one the multitudes fathered. I was the one they took and nailed to that cross. I was the one that was in that darkness. I was the one that went to hell. I was the one that rose again, but behold, I am alive forevermore. We found out who Jesus was. Then we found out also the understanding of our personal salvation. That was in the last telecast. That Jesus did not come just to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. Jesus didn't come to establish the, the Christian religion or any other religion. He came because men and women were dead to God and they needed a resurrection power and their spirits needed to be made alive and he died and rose again that we might have everlasting life. Amen. Amen. That same pulsating, eternal, everlasting life that John saw in that resurrected Jesus in Revelation chapter 1 beats in my body. It pulsates in me. I have the life of God. And if you're saved, you have the life of God. Yeah. Well, don't fabricate. Go ahead and talk. You didn't get religion. That'll never take you to heaven. You see, our spirits are dead to God. When Jesus comes in, he makes the inner man alive to God. Alive to God. That's salvation. Now, he says here, 
He says here in this uh, passage that I just read you, listen to it in the, in, the, in the Living Bible, the Paraphrased Bible. I beg of you, I, a prisoner here in jail for serving the Lord, to live and act in a worthy manner of those who have been chosen for such wonderful blessings as these. I want to talk about the practical side of our redemption. If we've got it inside, it's going to come out. Work out your salvation that God has worked in you. Work it out. You know, if we're really saved, our lives are going to show that we're saved. Paul talks about those who claim they know God, but in their lives they deny and reveal that they don't know God. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. It's not enough to say that you're saved. Jesus said, talk is cheap. No, Jesus... The Lord is saying to Paul here by the Holy Ghost that, that there is a practical application. There is something that ought to come out in our lives if we have these blessings, if we have been resurrected, if our spirits have come alive, if we're children of the Most High God, our lives should show it. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Amen. Our lives should show it. So I'm going to read you some of these passages. It said... Uh, in chapter 5, verse 3 in the Living Bible, let there be no sex sin or impurity among you. Ooh, going from the sublime to the ridiculous. I've been talking about the glory of God and the life of Jesus and everlasting life. And here, here the Holy Ghost even takes up things like this. Let there be no sex sin or impurity among you. 